We're now going to look at a few types of utility software. So by nature, utility software is very kind of generic and does loads of stuff. So it can analyze, configure, optimize, or maintain system depending on what the actual specific software does. So very generic, but it's a type of system software as opposed to application software. It's usually where it's defined out of the two. So an example would be encryption software, which encrypts and decrypts files. There will be a video on the process of encryption, but it's relatively self-explanatory. You have some data, you scramble it up to make it into ciphertext, and then when you want to decrypt it, you need you basically do the reverse of a process, and you get your data back into what is known as plain text, which is readable. And so this software maybe would encrypt a file attachment for email, and then you send it to your friend, and they can then decrypt it using your key provided and the encryption software. A second example is data compression, which is there just to reduce the size of files, like creating a zip file, zip compressed file in Windows. So there are two ways to do this, lossy and lossless. Lossy is where you actually basically delete part of a file in order to reduce its size, quite an effective method, but obviously there's some disadvantage, like your video quality goes down, for example. Lossless is where it kind of shuffles around bits to make it more efficient. To reduce the store, uh, to reduce the file size, but it's not as effective. If you need to know about this in more detail, there'll be a separate video on it as well. Um, a third example is backup software to create copies of data and allow restoration from copies. It may create a system restore point, a, a, a kind of like a disk image that you can restore in the future. One way it can do this is just a full backup where all data is backed up whenever you select this option. So you've got this software on your computer, you select the backup, and it just collect all the data and create a copy of it. It could also do an incremental backup, this is a slightly better way to do it, but it's more uh, complicated and requires, it needs to keep a record of what it's doing. So this is where you just copy data created after the previous backup. So you may want to run a full backup initially and then an incremental backup periodically, just to copy across the additional files you've added in that time. And of course, for the incremental backup to work, you need a previous full backup to compare it to. So in terms of evaluation, a full backup is slow to create. You've got to copy all the files, but it's very kind of straightforward to restore. You just restore everything. Whereas kind of the opposite is true for an incremental backup. It's fast to create because you're only adding the files you actually need to. You're not doing the whole process again. But then it's then slow to restore because you kind of need to step backwards or in fact, you've got to kind of go from the start and just add it sequentially each smaller backup so it's a slower process to restore a program that requires a bit more explanation is a defragger or just a defragmentation program so talking about hard disks here when you store data it's just put wherever there's available space which means it can become scattered across different sections of a disk you remember a hard disk is a physical disk and it doesn't really care whether data is stored, it just gets put there. If there's any space left, it gets put there. And data isn't necessarily stored in a nice contiguous order. So running this program will reorganize your data so that the data that's related gets moved closer together. And on a hard disk, depending on the location, the actual read time is different. So if the same program's data is stored on different parts of the disk, then it's going to take slightly slower to read them because it's going to have to move around, literally, because it's a physical disk. So doing this defragging actually makes it faster to access. So just to show you this visually, if we've got this data here representing by colors, so we've got if we're going to delete the green data here, it leaves gaps essentially. So if we want to add some data that's got a larger capacity than the deleted data, it's going to leave, it's going to split up basically, it's going to need to jump to the end. So you can see that the data is not contiguous, i.e. in a row. And as I say, this can slow the accessing process down if this was a more drastic uh, scattering. So after defragmentation, it will basically just rearrange it to become more efficient. So in this case, it might just shift across. Okay, just a few more then, nothing too complicated. First of all, file converters basically just change data from one format to another. So change the file extension, basically. File extensions are part of standards and it will just have to adapt from one standard to another. So programs that repair files are there in case a file gets corrupted. So it can get corrupted in loads of different ways. Corrupted mean kind of like some data is missing or is not organized properly and this can be done maybe for a virus that has damaged some of your files. Crashes, so perhaps it's crashed when you're saving, you may have experienced that playing games and just bugs in the software that cause some issues with how the data is stored. And this might be that it's deviating from the correct format of the file. And so there's no generic, there's no generic way how these uh, programs fix these files but Usually they're specific to a single file format due to the kind of complexities of each format. So there's not a single way you can talk about how they actually fix them, they will do it differently.
and antivirus software falls under the utility category. So these are not just for viruses, they're just remove and detect malware. Malware as a whole, a virus is a subcategory of malware as we've looked at in the security video. And they're there to prevent malware from being installed and they provide what's known as real-time protection, especially in pro versions. Maybe in free versions it's more of a passive protection, but active protection or real-time protection is where it's constantly scanning for suspicious activity, like maybe USB ports or your internet connection, it's constantly checking. Whereas passive is maybe where you'd specify it to you have to force it to run a test, for example. So antivirus kind of covers all malware, including spyware, but you can get separate antivirus software. So spyware is a program that works in the background and collects data about users, so maybe passwords, credit card information, and so on. So it can be very malicious. And the way this software works, and antivirus too, is by maintaining a database of known spyware. So this is why it's important to keep updating your antivirus or anti-spyware, because the, the database of current known types of program or attackers is updated constantly so it's really important to update the database. Okay just to wrap up this topic, nothing to do with utility software, let's look at models and simulations because we've got to put it in somewhere. So a software model is designed to simulate aspects of a real world, it's about simplifying an aspect of a real world and then we can run tests on it to simulate it. So different examples, the weather is clearly a very complex system which I mean forecasts are completely based off computer simulations. The economy, lots of simulations of the economy and things like nuclear physics where things basically on they're on such a large scale that we have to kind of make choices about what data we include and what data we exclude to uh, create our model. We covered some problem solving techniques in another topic uh, about abstraction and decomposition and it's similar in this case. You need to work out what connects aspects of real life problems. So if we're doing kind of a top down approach you'll get your problem and decompose it into sub problems and work out how they connect and crucially you need to make assumptions and simplifications. The three examples we just looked at are incredibly complicated. You cannot replicate them exactly but then if you are too, if you, if it's too simplified the tests you want to run are not relevant because they're not going to apply to the real world. So it's a different, it's a difficult mix and very difficult to do accurate simulations. So the model needs to be accurate enough to produce realistic results, otherwise you've wasted everyone's time by making a not very good program. But you, you've got to be careful not to make it so detailed that it takes too long to run. It could take days to run a complete, I mean you can't get a completely accurate, say, economic model, but it could take a long, long time to run and it just becomes unfeasible because you you can't test enough stuff on it and it might take years and years and years to get data to use in a model. So if you do create a good software model it clearly saves time and money, you don't have to, I don't know, build an aeroplane to find out it doesn't work as you expect for example and you can run tests repeatedly and factors like safety are not issues so if you were simulating a war or maybe a nuclear reactor or even the economy if you're a government you don't want to make it worse by trying a policy which actually in a simulation would show doesn't have the uh, expected result. So it's you're, you're doing it in a safe environment basically to sum up. So really the core takeaway are the three things highlighted here. You've got to work out what connects our problems and you've got to be aware if you're going to need to make assumptions you don't fully understand the weather system for example and you're clearly going to have to simplify it to make it feasible.